It is the day before Thanksgiving, folks. It's the day before Thanksgiving. And what do I tell you guys? When you go over to your relatives, to your families, to your friends, let's have a good one. Let's not sit back and have to fight about all the things that went on. You know, let's make, let's have a good meal and tell everybody you love them and give them a hug and all that good stuff. We have a lot of time to go ahead and get deep. So that's my suggestion. A lot of people, you know, who uh, went ahead and got my stuff called How to Talk, my book called How to Talk. Uh, it's worth it. How to Talk to Your Right Wing Relatives, Friends, and Neighbors. <coughs> I tell them, hey, don't try doing the talking over Thanksgiving, right? Howard, we don't need to do the talking over nah. Thanksgiving. We can just go ahead and have fun, watch a football game, eat some turkey. Eat some pie. Eat some pie. What kind of pie do you like? Pecan pie. Pecan. Oh, I love me Is some there any pe- other kind? The, well, you know, you're right about that, Howard. I like pecan, but I also like the pumpkin pie and the, lemon, and the meringue. lemon meringue. And I also like sweet potato pie. Oh. Especially the one the from best. Patty LaBelle, man. Mm-hmm. She puts it out, I think, in, in one of the stores. I don't remember where she puts it out, but it is good. It is good. It is good. But folks, we have a great for you today and what i need to do is pull the show up because as i was messing with levels i closed the wrong screen but that's no. okay yes i did seven you one just connected all your viewers and listeners yes but i connected them back up ah, okay. you know so it was like whoa, we got it done i Folks, thought i felt the earth move yeah it did because you know you know we we have some some listeners on on the internet and on the interwebs and everywhere and what they do is they're like what the hell is wrong with you you met you you messed up and it's like oh i'm sorry they say that to me every day <laughs> well you know i don't know if they have the right to tell you that you know you know you're like my idol in here man because you like keep these things going brother so hey i want to do anything to make sure that you're happy Certainly desperate for heroes, aren't you? Uh, no, we're going to make you happy, brother. We're going to make you happy. But anyhow, folks, folks, 713-526-5738. Again, that number is 713-526-5738. Hey, folks, listen to me. The, 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 the subject today, title is, Former Conservative Republican Gets Real About America. A necessary move to live up to our rhetoric. And around this th- Thanksgiving times, it's a good time to for you to read the story. Not for you to jump over to your family and discuss it, but for at least read the story uh, from our good friend uh, Steve Schmidt. So here's the subtitle. Harmony in our country requires we all learn our unadulterated history. It makes atonement for our past accepted by those in the present. Steve Schmidt's essays are a good start. If you know who Steve, Steve is, Steve is a former, I think he used to work for George W. Bush. And he also was, you know, commentator now on MSNBC and all of that. And he finally threw his hands up in the air under Trump and said, I can't deal with this. I can't lose my values any longer. I am not only quitting to be an independent. I am quitting to be with a party that's actually going to be able to win and not only win, but save our democracy. 713-526-5738. One more time. 713-526-5738 if you want to discuss the subject. And before I get into the essay, like I said, every before I do the show, I write a corresponding newsletter for this show. And you can find that at politicsdoneright.com slash newsletter. Politicsdoneright.com slash newsletter. Why do I do this? Because a lot of times I would like some of the folks, if you, not, I mean, you don't have to read it to call in or anything like that. But the idea is, um, you know, since some of this stuff has a lot of issues in it, if you want to kind of probe and say, well, like, Berto, why did you say that? Or why did he say that? We can actually talk about that. I want this program to be a program that in, in Spanish, what we'd say is nos da alimentación. It, it, it feeds us. It feeds all of us together. I don't want us to just have shouting matches and I disagree with this or you're a left winger, you're a right winger. I want us to speak as human beings wanting to genu- genuinely solve problems, genuinely observe what problems are, even if we are not solving it immediately, being cognizant of what's out there. So that's the purpose here, politics done right. We do this stuff 10 times a week. 
uh, three times here at KPFT and otherwise on the internet. So we want to make a difference, not just talk, but talk with solutions and not only talk with solutions, but hear your voices. And when I say hear your voices, I'm not talking about just hearing progressive voices. I'm talking about hearing all voices, progressive, conservative, all of them. I tell you a little little thing. I I, I was a um, invited speaker at the uh, Cypress Tomball Democratic Club, and I figured I was going to go out there and talk to probably ten people. You know, a lot of these clubs, especially right after the election, people are kind of worn out. And I got there and it was a full house. And I'm like, dang, that's great. You know, and we had such a great conversation. And one of the topics that I wanted to cover is, uh, first of all, I wanted to let everybody feel like after this election occurred, you, your, your, your emotions or not your emotions, but your feeling for America should have grown. Because even as there, there, there are more Republicans who voted in this election, if you look at the House, and by the way, these are these are fuzzy numbers because you could have uh, the, the people who voted for the House look completely different than the people who voted in the different state races. But if you, uh, the House is a good template, and it turns out that uh, Republicans probably overperformed, or uh, by vo- Republican voters for the House overperformed Democrats by anywhere between four to seven points. I think, depending on which poll you look at, right? In other words, even as we were praising the Gen Zs and Gen and Xers for saving our democracy, uh, the truth is that Republicans have always come out dearly to vote. They are almost always at good max levels, okay? And even above and beyond that, uh, the with the Michigan st- House, entire Michigan state was now controlled by not only women, mostly women, but also the Democratic Party. The same can be said for uh, Minnesota, for Vermont, for Pennsylvania, etc. Places where we needed to have democracy saved. And what that also meant is that we had a lot of good Republicans voting for people that you would not have expected them to vote for. Because the only way you can have an overperformance of Republicans over Democrats, and still Democrats pretty much won the election except the House, is if you had Democrats, or rather if you had Republicans out there voting for Democrats. So when we take a look at this, It is great news. It means America is in flux. And what I told this group, I said, folks, be happy. America is yet again changing. The fever is breaking. And the fever is breaking where it needs to break. I don't want a country where if you are a Democrat, you absolutely only vote Democratic. If there's a darn good Republican guy that that's that going to beat the hell out of, of the, the policies that another Democrat wants. Right. I want them to fight for your vote, for our vote. I want them to say these are the policies that I support that's going to help your family. And if that comes from a Republican, that is who's going to get the vote. If that comes from a Democrat, that's who's going to get the vote. We ought to be in play. We ought, we're we not owned. We have to be in play for policies that support us all. So what I try to tell the group is, great, go out there and talk to your neighbors. Don't, don't, don't shy away because, you know, one of the ladies I asked the question because in her community, she's surrounded by people flying Trump flags and all that good stuff. And I said, go out there and shake their hands and say, hey, how you doing? What is it that you want, etc." You'd be surprised. And I told a couple of stories that I told in my book as well where I say, hey, guys, um, I had Republicans come and slap me in the in the in the uh, gym and saying, "Hey, Berto, I'm gonna make your day. I am voting. I'm voting a different slate this year. But by the way, Berto, I am no damn liberal Democrat. But I'm gonna vote this way this time. That's all you can ask for for folks to vote their interests. And if we get to the point where we are convincing people to vote their interests, we don't have to tell them what party to vote for because they're gonna vote their interests." And that is what's so important. And believe it or not, that is what happened in large part in 2022. Look at the numbers and you say, wow, a lot of people cross parties. The the big one was in Pennsylvania. As you watched how big uh, uh, 
how big Fetterman won and the governor, not that, uh, I don't remember his name right now, the governor from, um, for the new governor of Pennsylvania. So anyhow, let's get to the subject today. 713-526-5738. I would love to hear from you all. 713-526-5738. We had some good calls that came in on Monday, but you guys always wait till the end. It's like you want to hear the story first and then call in. I want you to call in and help share the story. But anyway, here is the, the, the title of the show. Former conservative Republican gets real about America, a necessary move to live up to our rhetoric. Subtitle, harmony in our country requires we learn our unadulterated history. It makes atonement for our past accepted by those in the present. Steve Schmidt essays are a good smart. That's a good start. I often read the warning by Steve Schmidt newsletter because he is one of the most honest national writers. I do not always agree with him, but I respect him. One of his recent articles, Our Faith Sought Harmony of Man with His Surroundings, was on point. The piece is a great Thanksgiving read that will provide a necessary perspective. It's a clear it's clear the man, unlike me, is a well-read history scholar. I like to make sure and let people know I do a lot of reading. I do a lot of contemporary reading. In other words, I like, as an engineer, I like to have solutions. I read things. I think historians and and chemists and these guys are scientists, right? And engineers take the work of scientists and make something productive out of it. That's how I see me as as a host of, a media host, that's the, the role I feel we play. We take all of that stuff that folks have done singularly. Steve Schmidt is singularly uh, written about history and government. Somebody may singularly write about economics. Somebody may singularly write about anthropology, etc. I feel as a goal is to understand and learn from what all their research has provided and put it into a ball that is useful to humanity, right? That's what engineers do. Engineers take the, sci- the what the nuclear physicists figured out and what the, the fluid mechanics figured out and then put it all together to create something that generates electricity for the rest of the world. All right. And that's how I see us having separations of jobs. So I consider I consider Steve Schmidt a very, very, very historically apt person that I can learn a lot from, just like I did in this article that he wrote. The article is long and with limited time, I must decide quickly if I will invest the time into any piece given the dozens of articles I receive daily. The first two paragraphs told me it would be a good one. And this is what this is how he started his article. He said, I was driving down a mountain road wondering who built it. I think about things like that when I look at my kids. I wonder if the notion of wonderment about everything around them ever crosses their minds or they just accept the road as is. Of course, it is a work in progress as all things are certainly American civilization is. The United States is a young country. While being the oldest constitutional republic in the world, America did not always exist as it does today. Welcome, uh, Maywood, to the program. That is true in several regards. Most importantly are the extensions of equal protection under the law, if not in reality, to every race, creed, and gender that had been written out of American liberty and denied equal citizenship with the right to vote. But it is also true territorially. Look. At America in 1800, John Adams was president. The western boundary of the United States stopped at the Mississippi River. Those two paragraphs has a lot of context. And I was like, okay, let me see where he is going to go from here. Where is Steve Schmidt going to go from here? As a Panamanian who immigrated to the United States and became a citizen at the first opportunity, I have a special relationship with my adoptive country. I describe much of this in my book, It's Worth It, How to Talk to Your Right-Wing Relative Friends and Neighbors. I lived through what America does abroad in foreign lands. I learned the good and the bad that were foundational to the country. And I understood the necessity as time passed at, that there would be a fight between atonement for our past and responsibility. 
Any writer who writes the following truthful paragraph in their article is one that one must continue to read. Why? Because you will be getting history as opposed to a myth. And this is what he wrote subsequent in this very long article. American presidents, this is Steve Schmidt speaking here. American presidents have long made comments about the peaceable character of the American people while speaking to Americans who are usually peaceful when the president of the United States is speaking to them. That doesn't mean they are peaceful as a group. We aren't. We never were. America is a violent country and it always has been. Time out. Um, this is me again now. When st- you have to understand who Steve Schmidt is to understand that comment. Steve Schmidt is a conservative or was a conservative, very conservative Republican under the Bush administration. And this guy, when I, when I read that, I'm like, oh, my God. You sound like a pinko liberal like me, my brother. But what it was, it's just the truth, right? So I'm reading this and I'm like, wow, let me continue. And he continues. The 19th century was a savage century of war, conquest, subjugation, and the largest slaughter of warm-blooded animals in human history. The purpose of the slaughter was to starve and subjugate the Great Plains Indian nations until they were forced into impoverishment on reservations. I skipped a few paragraphs and then it said, the domination, uh, the dominant American political ideology of the era became known as manifest destiny. All of you guys learned that in high school. I learned manifest destiny in Panama in a high school because let me tell you about foreign countries, folks. In foreign countries, we have to learn our own history. We have to also learn world history. And then there's a special cutout. We learn American history. All right. Uh, That is my upbringing. We had to learn those three facets of history. Your own, meaning the country that you're you're born in. The the world, meaning a a tacit understanding of the entire world. I mean, at my time, there were things like Soviet Union, etc. And we had to learn the capital cities of every single country in the world. And we were tested and grilled on all of those. We had to learn the cultures of these different countries. But then we singularly also had to learn American history from its inception to slavery, to emancipation, to women's rights, all of that were a part of our curriculum back in Panama. All right. Uh, So when I, when I hear, when I, when I listen to an American scholar who was in the Bush administration say these things, it, it, it immediately endears me to learning more from this person because I know This person is of the truth. All right, continuing. In the end, the most powerful nation won control of, oh, I I missed something. The dominant American political ideology of the era became known as Manifest Destiny, and it held that the United States of America, guided by the hand of providence, was predestined to spread and control the entirety of the territory between the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. In the end, the most powerful nation won control of territory, and once it was held, there would never be another the foreign power to take it back from the people who claim it, the very fierce people of the United States. What happened in 19th century America is that the dominant economic and military power settled all questions around its authority and power to control its sovereignty. It was a brutal era of history filled, like always, with both shame and glory. Notice how he says that. Shame and glory. Powerful. But to gain that power, yes, we did have to step on a few. That's where later I'll talk about atonement. But it is important for us to understand that all that we've gone through and all who make up America have lived through all of this. Unfortunately, too often... The history that we learn and uh, that we learn is sort of an antiseptic history. It's sort of a, you know George Washington cut down the tree and 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 never told a lie and you know we hear all those wonderful stories, but you know these are not the stories that the rest of the world know for for facts or many Americans themselves. As an example, 
you know, we talk about the Panama Canal being built by uh, America and this great engineering feat, which it was, right? The part that we never heard was that when America asked Colombia to build the canal in the province of Panama, Panama being a province of Colombia, uh, that Colombia said, absolutely not. We all have treaties with the with the Lesseps, uh, rather with the French, etc. And America said, oh, okay, cool. What are we going to do? What we're going to do is we're going to put a battleship in the Gulf of Colón, that's the city that I'm from, and those people in the back uh, that, that are trying to get independence from Colombia, we're going to help them out. We're going to put a battleship out there and say, okay, Colombia, you try to take it back. The people in the Panamanian said, okay, we declare independence of, from Colombia. And the United States says, okay, you are recognized by the United States of America and there's a battleship in the Gulf of Colón in order to make sure that nobody comes to you. And by the way, we would like that Frenchman, the Lesseps and Bonavaria, to sign a treaty to build the Panama Canal in perpetuity. We will own five, or, or, no, we'll rent five miles on either side of the canal, and this cannot, oh, all of that done in a few days, right? That is what, that was not only manifest destiny that will speak soft and carry a big stick, even though the big stick policy, I don't think, was in effect back in 1903 when all of that occurred. But, the idea is that when you hear other people talk about America, I always tell people, included in, 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 in the book, I always tell people a very important fact, and that is America is loved around the world. The people of America are loved around the world. There's absolutely no doubt about that. I don't care if you're in Iran. I don't care if you're in Afghanistan. I don't care if you're in Panama. I don't care where you are. But the, the atrocities done by the corporations and uh, by the corporations under the auspices of the United States government, or maybe I should say the opposite. I should say the, uh, the, the United States government under the auspices of the corporations is what I probably should have said, because they're the ones who benefit from all those those things that, that go on out there. Anyway, I need to get back to the story, but call 713-526-5738 if you want to add to this. 713-526-5738. Uh, and uninformed America cannot be a critical thinking America. Worse, it puts us on a path to self-destruction as the strengthened aggrieved assert their power over the aggrieved. Schmidt expresses this as follows. I want to repeat that sentence because I really want folks to understand that. An uninformed America, if we are uninformed, cannot be a critically thinking America. In other words, if we want to think critically, we have to have the ability to know where we came from, how we came about, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're not doing that. Worse, it puts us on a path to self-destruction as the strengthened aggrieved, those, in other words, as people become more powerful, as all, as all the different factions in our country become more powerful, Latinos get more powerful, women get more powerful, blacks get more powerful. When I say powerful, I mean they're finally being able to assert themselves like everybody else in the country. They know the history. They have always known their history, right? But uh, America at large was not taught that history. They were not taught the truth. They were taught some sort of a sanitized glory, 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 hallelujah. So it puts us on a path of self-destruction as the strengthened aggrieved assert their power over the aggrieved. In other words, when, when all those different factions realize, okay, we can actually speak now, that's what they do. And that's where we are now. Schmidt expresses this as follows. And he says this, there seems to be a lack of curiosity in the American character around what just happened, as opposed to what is coming next. Perhaps it is a mark of national impetuousness at, that Americans seem mostly oblivious around the concept that America today is inexorably connected to America's past. It remains an astounding fact and great piece of trivia that John Tyler, born in 1791 and the 10th president of the United States, whose treachery de delivered him to service in the Confederate House of Representatives, has a living grandson in 2022. There is an accompanying 
arrogance that rides comfortably with the obliviousness and ignorance. It gives license to people in the present who know nothing about the past to indict the totality of the struggle for justice and progress against a present standard that is a delude that is as deluded as it is preening. It is also not cost free. There is a cost for fighting over the past, which cannot be changed. And it is a terrible one. The fight costs the future and strangles the imagination needed to create it. Yet there are occasions where great injustices can be recognized, repudiated, and a new beginning forged with mutual grace, joy, and an achievement. I love that last paragraph because that's a paragraph of hope. That's a paragraph that says we, in as much as what we've gone through, we can come through just right. But the idea is we have to be curious. We have to make things curious for folks. We have to be able to atone for the things we've done. Here's the kicker. There used to be a time in America where every student had to receive a class known as civics. And why did we teach civics? We taught civics to teach the, 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 the average citizen how to be a good American. You get a job, you work, you, you, you go, you vote, you elect people who, whose policies you agree with that's going to do better for you. But you learn that it's really we, the people. And as much as we have some arcane structures like the Electoral College, which is a vestige of some evil doing... Uh, we still have one person, one vote. And if we are in sync with our vote, things normally work out fine. You can control your own destiny. We also had things like laws where radio stations had to put on, give everybody the opportunity to communicate. We were, a, we, were a, we were a country that was learning. We were a country that was improving intellectually. We were a country that said we wanted to know more. But it scared a lot of folk. The powers that be got scared. The people who, uh, the, the business class got scared. The Powell Manifesto then got written and said, you know what, folks? Those darn folks are becoming progressive. They're becoming too damn intelligent. We got to stop teaching civics in school. We have to start instituting sanitized history. We have to start making sure. I mean, if you take a look at what DeSantis is doing in, in Florida right now, they want it to be taught that the only economic system that a democracy can work with is a, is a, is a, is a system based on the market on the mythical market, I call it. So, I mean, the indoctrination is obvious, right? They're telling teachers what they can teach. Now, yesterday, one of, uh, one of Trump's uh, protégés, uh, Pompeo, came out and said, Russia is not the most dangerous uh, country to the, I mean, entity towards the United States. North Korea is not the most dangerous entity towards the United States. You know who it is? It's Guy Garden, the 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 the, the lady who runs the uh, teachers' union. She is the most dangerous person to America. Think about that, folks. Gaiden, I think is her name. I don't remember her, name, but you know, that is the most dangerous person in in to the United States, not Putin. I want you guys to understand where we are and why Steve Schmidt wrote a piece like he did that we are going through right now. But give us a call, folks, 713-526-5738. The, the lines are pretty dead today. I know I know you kind of want to hear the stuff first and then come on in. So by the way, Maywood says uh, on the internet, being a progressive does not require you to be a Democrat. Exactly. I, that is the reason why when I write articles at the Daily Coast, I, and they give me hell about that, I usually say, Democrats and progressives would like to get XYZ passed. And some of the Democrats inside of the Daily Coast would say, um, well, why are you saying Democrats and then using progressive thereafter? I'm like, well, because 
progressives don't have to be Democrats. A little history here. The people who helped pass the civil rights were progressive folks, right? And guess what? There were a hell of a lot, a lot of de- Republicans that were needed because the, the, the Democrats in those days from the South wanted to have nothing to do with civil rights. So uh, uh, for, for what you said, Maywood, you're absolutely enteramente correcto. You're absolutely right. Uh, he continues, it was the conservative Republicans who used to be the most progressive policies. Exactly. It's not about spending, but rather investing, investing in community, the society, and the economic investments, but being returns. Oh, you hit the nail on the head. All right, continuing with the article. Steve Schmidt's article is an essential read, especially in our times. He even provides a few things uh, that America must do to atone. I do not know where Steve stands on reparations, but I think it was a form of atonement missing from his article, given the quantifiable harm that afflicts an entire people in our country. I wrote the following message on the article in, this, in his Substack newsletter. Uh, I'll tell you what I wrote. Let's bring Tori in and then I'll, I'll, I'll t- tell you what I wrote. And folks, give us a call, 713-526-5738. Again, that number is 713 713- Five two six five seven three eight. Tori, come on in. Tori, come on in. How's it going, Egberto? I am doing fine, sir. Talk to me. Yeah, I can speak to the evil of the uh, uh, government of Texas and how they regulate history teachers yes. in the curriculum. Right. Um, you know, and where you know they don't want people like me, right? You know, radical lefty anarchist kind of folks teaching history, right? And uh, so the, and they don't want poor people and people of color teaching history. I mean, it's a Republican club, you know, HISD, as far as the management. Right. You know, most of the the, uh, the principals of the schools are Republican. And, of course, you know, almost everybody, you know, back when I was teaching, you know, at the state level, uh, the DEA, were Republicans. Right. And uh, they want their version of history, which is, you know, Texas is... Uh, all about you know banks and cattle ranches and you know railroads. They don't want you to talk about uh, slavery. Hey, Tori, Tori, I want In to keep Tori, Tori, Tori. Hold on of the conversation. I want you to stay online. But there is somebody that I definitely want to speak to. His name is Barry, and I want you to be a part of this. Barry, Barry, Barry. How are you doing, my brother? It's been a while, huh? Uh, yeah. Oh, wait. Let me see if I remember which Barry I'm talking to. It's not Barry Manilow or Barry White <laughs> or Barry Sanders. Hey, Barry, talk to me, my brother. Talk to me. You says, why oh, are well, you preaching Marxism? I ain't preaching. No, 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 no. Why are you still preaching Marxism? <laughs> no, no, brother, 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 brother. I love that you say that, man. Listen to okay. me. Hey, Barry, where have you been? And what took you so long to get into the conversation? Well, KKPFT seemingly went dark for about two years. Yeah, well. All the programs got... All the program got changed around. I know uh, what time you were on. Well, on. Let, me, let, 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 me just, on. let me just make sure and get you up to speed. Monday, Wednesday, Friday at noon. All yeah. right. Hey, Tori okay. is on the line with us as well. So I'm going to let you say your piece, and then we're going to also bring Tori into the conversation. So go ahead, Brother right. Barry. Uh, to talk, talk about the uh, wonders of socialism, we haven't seen that. We saw Venezuela go from being one of the wealthiest countries in South America. Mm-hmm behind capitalism and markets mm-hmm. to become one of the poorest behind we're all equal. But this is what Ayn Rand says about this foolishness, mm-hmm. that since we do not know who did what, we must have a redistribution. It doesn't matter whether someone contributed a trillion and another one contributed a dollar. Okay. They're both equal in the eyes of socialism. That's not and true. I'm saying you, you need a class to create wealth. Mm-hmm. Every country suffers from not having a class to create wealth. You recall a madman named Idi Amin from mm-hmm. Africa years ago, right? Yeah. He kicked out the uh, Indian shopkeepers. They were, quote unquote, creating wealth. All right. Wait, hold on. Hello? Terry, you got dropped. I, I I don't want you to leave the line, Terry. I want you to get back on because I, I know what Barry's going to talk about and you need to answer some of this, Terry. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Barry. You never heard of a madman named Idi Amin, right, from Africa? Right. He had kicked out the Indian shopkeepers. Oh, they were cre- taking the wealth, but they were also creating the wealth. Yes. Uh, ten years later, a new leader comes in, and guess what? He invites them back. Mm-hmm. Because every country needs someone to create wealth. Right. There are no moral victories. The poor cannot live on the platitudes of bleeding hard liberals. Okay. 
the poor are not going to get lifted out of poverty by preaching Marxism and socialism. All right, let me ask you this because you, you, you let me let me tell you first of all, Barry. You, you know, you continue to want to just name me a socialist, a Marxist, and all these other ists that seems left words, right? I don't really care what folks want to call what what I what I preach. Let me tell you what I preach, and let me ask you a few questions, okay? And it goes as follows. Uh, is Jeff Bezos deserving of all the money that he has? He has earned it. He's he, earned. His how did he earn that money, please? He earned his income by making a product that people want to buy. Okay. I. John Galt from Ron Ron's Alice Rug. Okay. Let Let me ask you another if you question. You have a problem with Jeff Bezos' profit? You can stop. You can chart. You can lessen his profit anytime you like. No, no, no that's not, a, that's not true though. By not buying his product. That's not true at all. You are not forced to buy Amazon products, are you? That's not true at all. Let's let's. Wait let's, a minute. Are you forced to buy Amazon products? When I when you when I ask a question, you answer. When you answer, I then respond. That's how we have a communication, so we don't speak over yeah, each but other. Yeah, the question though. We don't Jeff speak, Bezos is Barry. Fortune. Barry, Go let's ahead. let's start on the right foot. We don't speak Wait, over Jeff each Bezos other. Has earned his fortune. Go ahead. You said that already. Why do you need to repeat it? So stop. Let's, brother, brother, hold it. Hold it. Now, here's the answer, sir. All right? No, Jeff Bezos did not earn it. And saying that we can simply stop uh, buying the product is an immature response. And let me explain why. All right? Jeff Bezos... Uh, and, and the reason I always use Jeff Bezos is that I have a story to tell. I uh, Jeff Bezos uh, started his fortune with uh, with Amazon with something known as one click. All right. What Jeff Bezos did as soon as he realized that he was going to do this sort of a shopping cart called Amazon, he decided to patent one click. And when he patent one click, there's a 17 year hold on that particular way of doing business. All right. Oh my and God. There's no. Oh my God. This because this is that was my product. <laughs> my product is uh, the the product that I was developing was placed on hold to create another product. Now that said, Bezos knew nothing about programming that this type of technology or anything. Other engineers came in. And they are the ones who designed okay, the well, system. Well, well, We're without not. Get, without giving me, without giving me the history, how much is Jeff Bezos' money? Do you want to seize? I want to seize most of it, and because most okay, of it is most of it, most of it is on ninety-five percent, ninety-five percent, what ninety-one percent minimum. And the 91%. reason why is okay, why stop there? Why not go to ninety-nine percent? Well, we probably will need to go there after a certain amount of money. I okay, won't doubt that at all. Why Jeff Bezos? Well, why not go after Elon Musk and, and uh, McKenzie Bezos? I, ag I agree. I agree. That we should not. I, let me tell you something, okay? All the roads that we build, everything that we build as a society, those parasites use. And then we get those charged twice. Those have also paid the largest share of the taxes to because, build the roads. Because they've took, taken most the of the money, of course. The should have a private role because the Rockefellers pay more taxes for sir, roads than, you, than you pay. Sir, th that's not the point. The point is not that because they're paying it with money they stole legally. Oh, please. Uh -uh. That's, what I, that's what I love. I, I, love I love when you right-wingers, brother, brother, <laughs> slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down. All right, down. we're going to end the conversation with saying that a free market is a free market. Is a free market? No. I have the right to earn. Oh, wait a minute. I have the right to earn a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, a million dollars, a billion dollars. If you earn it, you're right. If you, you earn it, you do not have the right to come in and seize my profit, my income, because you got a problem with the rich. No, I have no problem with the rich. Right? I, so I, as I, Reagan I, said, I sir, want America to always be a place where anybody can get rich. Barry, listen to me now. Don't don't hang yet, and then I'll go to Tory. But listen to me, and listen, and we'll end on this note as follows. It goes. It's simple. I do not mind people who earned their money. What I mind are people who 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 pretty much uh, extort their money. And most so capitalists, the people buy. No, most capitalists extort their money. We can discuss okay. that on who another is, subject uh, at another day. Elon Musk is not forcing anybody to buy Tesla, is he? No, but you know, Elon Musk took a lot of money for the government to create you Tesla. Don't have to buy Elon Tesla Musk products. took a lot of money from the government right. to create Tesla. Elon Musk took oh. a lot of government to create SpaceX. Elon Musk uh, took a lot of, and all of these billionaires, a lot of the funding that they're getting okay. comes from us. We, that's the not people, I'm not, it's not okay, a, that's, that's not sir, true. Barry, that is not up for debate. Okay. Look okay, it up. Sir, we, we respectfully disagree. No, there's no disagreement, sir. There's agreement. Uh, Barry, right Barry, Barry, sir, 
Hold on. Okay, how much of Oprah? Barry, most of it. How much of Oprah's fortune can you see? Most of it. And I'll tell you why. And listen to me, exactly. Wait a minute, wait. So by the time you're done, there will be no billionaires, right? No, exactly. There's no, we should have no billionaires. I don't have, you see, a lot of people, a lot of people. Should millionaires? A lot, yes, we should. Yes, definitely. Okay, so we should have one million or four million? No, no, I don't know the number. I'm not smart Five enough million, to know the number. Million, 20 million? I said I am not Over smart enough. To, million. Hold on. Again, Barry, don't get silly. I said I'm not smart enough to know the number. I, I but admit. You are smart enough to sit there, but to I'm smart enough to know that. I, I am smart enough to know that billionaires <laughs> are thieves. I am smart right, enough to know uh, that. Uh, sir. I'm I'm gonna be calling your show on a regular basis. I love you, Bar- you Barry. Barry, you know I, I love you, right? You get some, Barry, stop it. Barry, I suggest you get some help first, okay? Barry, listen to me before you go. Before you go, I want you <laughs> to listen. Help, before you go, I want you to listen to me. I want, because I want you to keep calling because you are entertaining. Okay. But here's the deal. I love you. I love you, brother. But I think you need you need to do a little bit more research. You have a wonderful no, day. I need Thank to you, brother. Get rich. All right, Tori, come on in, Tori. Barry hey. is, a, is a fun guy. Go ahead. Yeah, so, you know, I called in to make a comment about Panama and then how teachers are, uh, you know, forced to teach, you know, a certain kind of curriculum in Texas. Yes. And, uh, but as, first up, you know, uh, as far as, you know, the Ayn Rand philosophy, mm-hmm. Ayn Rand was a sociopath, and the problem with it is at a psychological level, where identity is formed. Right. And something went wrong with these people, you know, at that age when they're forming their identities, you know, age, you know, 13 to 24 or so. And they have this tiny, tiny, tiny little concept of the self. They don't have a larger concept like but, the self is. Tori, let me interrupt you because it, it's deeper. I want, I don't want you to miss something here because it's deeper. First of all, Anne Rand herself at, on her deathbed, she was on social security, the same types of policies that she hates the, the support from we, the people Anne Rand uh, was on, on social security. These people only speak this way when they have money. As soon as they have a cut in money, they're looking for a handout from government. And this goes from the very rich all the way up. So continue, sir. So anyway, back to uh, Panama. You mentioned that. And I just remembered something when I was studying history ages and ages ago. Uh, there was uh, somebody from the U.S. I can't remember if it was some uh, military attache or mm-hmm. just some businessman, but they went to Columbia with a suitcase full of cash yeah. and bought off a couple of generals. I think it was like two or three generals. And, you know, that's how it was so easy to take, you know, Panama away from Colombia. It was, they got those, you know, they just paid off the generals. You just buy the military. And uh, so, uh, you know, but then back to the state of Texas and how they uh, basically enforce the curriculum is through the test that teachers potential teachers have to take to get certified to teach history. And uh, there's n- there's so many things on that test that have nothing to do with True. any of the history curriculum True. that anyone ever studies. True. You have to be very privileged in order to understand some of the things they talk about art in the 1930s or films that are, you know, like silent films and all this stuff that, you know, You know, somebody like me, who started off going to college taking, you know, art and film classes, like a five-year-old ordering up a dessert menu. Right. And so I had all this richness of experience because, you know, I could go to school and just take classes for fun. But there's a lot of uh, low-income and people of color that want to be history teachers, and they are struggling with the tuition, and they go and they take all the history classes, and they get their history degree, and then they go and they take the state test, and they have to take it six or seven, eight times before they pass because they asked all this stuff that only privileged people would be able to answer in order, in order to get your state certification. Unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately, when you make that statement that you just made, uh, you have some in the intelligentsia that would say, what are you saying? They're not capable of doing that. No, it's just a different world experience. It's like, it's like bringing somebody over from some, uh, an Asian country that doesn't drink tea from a, uh, from a, uh, from a cup and saucer, right? And then giving an example on an SAT exam that uses a cup and saucer to, 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 to find some level of uh, logic that that person has, right? I looked, you know, my, my daughter took a test one time and she said, Dad, do you know if I didn't live in, in Kingwood and wasn't exposed to X, Y, and Z, 
I would have gotten this answer wrong, that answer wrong, this answer wrong, that answer wrong, because these are things that you don't know. But when you try to, you know, it's, it's simple minded to be a billionaire, right? A billionaire is simple minded. Hey, I earned it. No, you didn't. You know, I, I, I create, you know, it's like the, I always use Bezos because the same bet product Bezos created, I also was writing. And not only me, thousands of other engineers out there who wanted to do a, um, to create a, um, a, what you call it? A, 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 a selling platform. So, I mean, um, but he, he throws all of that out. And then, then he says, now, oh, I made this. No, you didn't. There's so many of us out there that could create this simple thing. And, you know, billionaires give themselves a lot more worth. Uh, Bill well, Gates. nobody's going to tax themselves. Right. You know, it's up to the government to do that. And, you know, the problem with having this many billions of dollars is that it distorts the political system. Right. And they're able to buy off the billionaires and they'll be able to, you know, fund the laws that, you know, keep them from having to pay taxes. Exactly. So, you know, uh, it's, uh, you know, chicken and egg thing. You know, we've got to get control of these people through the tax code. Because, you know, Jeff Bezos did things legally to make his billions of dollars. The problem is that it's a concentration of wealth. There you go. Tori, let me get the political system. Tori, let me get, you can stay on, but let me get Baba Chakwe on. Baba, come on in. My... I turned to my brethren in Yashua. Good morning to you, Berto. Hey, my brother. How you doing, Baba? I am better, man. Now that I have finally found some, I've, I've been, I found my right mind by being it. I finally, <laughs> I finally put it on 90.1. All right. I'm <laughs> so, glad, I'm glad you put it on 90.1. Remember to tell other people to do the same. <laughs> yes, sir. That's right. So I just wanted to holler at you for a minute. Yes, sir. Just since you got turned on there, because he can respond if he, if he wants to, because, but you, you're, He's under no obligation to respond. You are. Yes, sir. Because you are of the people who make you a leader, in my, in my humble opinion. I, I hear Europeans talking about uh, teachers in Texas and other states that are, have, been, uh, have been taken uh, hostage by um, uh, persons who are reactionary conservative. That's what they call themselves, right. of course, among other things, about being teachers are being forced to teach certain Curriculum, as if, as if that, Egberto, that ever since the government of the United States and the state governments took over public education, because I know you know and I know, African people that were freed from chattel slavery were the ones who started public education in America. Now, I know Tory probably knows that, so I'm sure that's old news. But I'd like to know from you, if he doesn't want to answer, what does it mean about teachers being forced to teach some particular a curriculum as if they've never been never been forced to teach a certain curriculum. It ain't like whenever you get your teacher certificate, you can go in and teach um, uh, the truth about uh, the the uh, transatlantic yeah, you know, slave yeah. trade yeah, Baba, Baba, with uh, Christopher Columbus. So I, I, I would like to know what in the world does he mean when he says them forced to, forced to teach curriculum all of a sudden. Baba, let me tell you, this this is what really upset me. And, and, and later on, I'm going to ask uh, Tori to chime in, but this is what really upset me. When Pompeo said the most dangerous person in America uh, is not Putin, I mean, to America, it's not Putin, but it's White Garden, the, 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 the lady who runs the, the, the teachers' union. And what they mean by that is they are fighting against doing exactly what you're talking about. And that is they're not trying to get teachers. They're not forcing teachers to teach history in a certain way. They're forcing teachers to lie to their students. They're tr- they're exactly. forcing teachers yes, to re- reinvent history. Yes, in other sir. words, they yes. want to teach them that the, the, it's from I mean, from, I mean, we're not only talking about the slave trade that they're just they're calling these guys immigrants yeah, yeah. now. We're talking about a lot more. They're trying to tell yeah. them that uh, the only way you can have a democracy is if you have a market economy and all these things that they're they're not trying to yes, teach. Sir. They're trying to indoctrinate with 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 yeah. poli- with with policies that supports yes, a very distinct and small class. And what we exactly. have to do as a society is educate ourselves among ourselves, among the yes, masses, sir. so that we yes, are yes, not, sir. I mean, and, and by the way, this is not by accident. There's a document that was put out in the 90, early 1970s from Lewis Powell called the Powell yes, Memo that detailed yes, how 
all of these things were going to be instituted within not only curriculum, not only universities and colleges and high schools and churches, but the media. Yep. And henceforth, mm -hmm. the grand misinformed America came out of this one memo. We got the Cato Institute, the Heritage Foundation, and all these guys that give information with plausible, that, that seems plausible, but are basically yes, lies. Tori, you want to yeah. chime in a bit? Yeah, well, this is kind of, you know, there's a place where there's an intersection between uh, the Andran stuff and the Texas uh, Board of Education, and it has to do with identity. And Republicans know this more than Democrats or liberals know this, but, you know, the identity formation of anybody, you know, between the ages of like 12 and 24, that's when people decide, uh, you know, for the rest of their life, 90% of any population is going to have the same toothpaste, the same you know, favorite drink, you know, right. the same political party for the rest of their life. And so the job of the CEA is to basically keep radical teachers and, you know, very progressive teachers out of these class, the history classrooms in particular, until, you know, during these formative years when kids are 16, 17, 18 years old, because, you know, we can influence them. We can open their minds and change and have an influence on their identity that they'll have for the rest and of their life. And that is their fear. And they want to prevent that. Right. They want to nip that in the bud. Exactly. they want to do the same thing we do. They want to enforce kids' identities to vote. Okay, hold on a second. Tori, we have to be careful with our word story. They are not trying to do the same thing that we are trying to do. We are trying to tell the truth. They are not. Okay. There's a difference. So we well, they're, they're trying to form identity. I understand that, but what ideals. what I'm but what I'm saying is what I'm saying is we have to be you know, and I hear this a lot that I, <laughs> I, that I want to make sure that we don't do. We are on the side of truth. They are they are creating history. We are delivering history. There's a difference. We can't create well, that. We want to create large identities right. where the self is everything in the universe. Right. Kind of then selfishness. Exactly. And they want to create these identities that get as small as. Like, I agree. 100 percent, sir. You want to call it, you know, 100 percent. Yes, Chakwe. Go ahead, Chakwe. Hey, go ahead. Yes. And please, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Thank you. I just, I just want to just speak to the fact that I, I noticed with all due respect, you know, to the uh, to my uh, brother of European uh, ancestry how that uh, he speaks in rather vague, ambiguous ways in using the term they. <laughs> oh, no, no. As, as, if, as if the they are some, somehow or another distinct and different from the him. Oh, no, no. Actually, on let, they. Let, me, let, me, let me defend my brother Tory here, man. Uh, Tory is a please, part of our do. movement. Tory is our please movement, do. brother. Let me just tell you that. Please do. Please, please. Look, yeah. I, I, I'm ignorant about that. Yeah. So well, let me, let, the let, way he's speaking is the way no, that no, I'm no, used no. to hearing. No, uh, let me. Because. Uh, let me tell you. Let me tell you who who is a, is anathema to our movement. A brother Barry, who called earlier, and if he wants to call yeah, again, I mean, he can. Barry I mean, is, you I mean, know. I mean. So so here is what's important, and this is where I come into play with the way I try to bring people together. Right? I don't bring yes, people sir. together on hue. I don't bring people together on color skin or whatever they have. I bring people together on concepts, on 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 what they support, who they are, and I can tell you that brother Tory is a part of this progressive movement that's trying to be truth telling i the only reason i looked at <laughs> yes, brother terry and said hey man uh hey man uh you know uh say we are on the truth side is that all of us as progressives have a tendency not yes. to assert uh that we are that we don't have to ask if we're right i mean we yes, you sir. can you can correct us i mean i make mistakes all oh, of yeah. the times yeah. right me too me too i make me mistakes too, all yes, of the sir. time but me we too. have yes, to sir assert yes, that we are that what we are what the, the position that we are taking is the moral position and then may and may i may i just say just to make sure that i was not a uh, yes sir uh, misunderstood by anyone in our audience including i know i know you Tori is Tori is Tori is the person <laughs> but, on the other but, line I mean, there are those there are those that don't know me as i know you and you know me and that is it so for reason i'm saying that i in no way shape form or fashion was suggesting that Tory doesn't have, and I'll just use the colloquial term, the best of intention. Mm -hmm. You feel me? You feel me? You feel me? Yes, so, I, I do. So what I want to make sure that to anybody is that I am not quote unquote. It was just that you know, you know, from from my earliest days, I remember a group of persons uh, that are related to Corey's 
physiological genetics <laughs> that would often. Well, I'm just saying. I'm just, I got you. I got you. You know. I got you. Uh, that you know, they would say things like, "Well, they're like that, but but we're not like that. I'm not like this." So what I'm saying, I'm just saying because the other people in the audience as well, and I need to be clarified to let someone know because see, while you have a larger and a probably a much more noble agenda in terms of as you just said, bringing different cultures together, different. I'll, I'll say different ideology, but there are, there are limitations to that, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, let, <laughs> but I mean, Baba, I, I but, hear but, you. I, I hear you. I would be in a foxhole with you. I would be in a foxhole with Chakwa. Exactly. I mean, with, with Tori. Yes, I wouldn't be so in a yes, foxhole sir, no. with Barry. <laughs> right. Exactly. And I'm, and I'm saying, you know. And Barry, that, you, you know, know, I love you, Barry, but I won't be in a foxhole yes. with you. Yeah. And, and, I, and I would say, you know, that, you know, the fact of the matter is the only way I would be in a foxhole with Tori is if you were in there. I'm going to be straight up because, see, you don't need to convince me of your soul, your intent. I got you. I got you. Conscious or otherwise. But what I'm saying, you could say, man, come on, take my word. This man is down for it. And and that's where trust... And that's where trust comes in, brother. That's where trust comes in. We have to... And and I'm... And my okay, circle of trust, sir, my circle of trust, yes. I want my circle of trust to look like America because that is yes, how sir. we are going to survive. Am I correct, Tori? Yes. Um, yeah, well, and uh, <laughs> I mean, just kind of <laughs> chimes in with uh, yeah. <laughs> No, no, that's how, you, you have to know Tori to know how he talks, okay? Trust me. <laughs> right, okay. You know, okay, this, right. okay. You know, this whole conversation kind of, you know, again, it's about identity. Are we going to have big identities or small ones? I think racial identity is a small identity. It's like nationalism. Oh, you lose me there. Or you lost me there. Okay. Already? Yeah. He lost okay. me there, well, Berto, because yeah. I'm, I'm a Gavi. I'm I'm I got you. Let me tell you something. I'm a Gavi. I so got you. He lost I, me there. See, that's what I told you. I, I, I'm about racial identity, and yes. I don't make no apologies to the bones yeah, about it. Tell. And anytime somebody who's not like European, then they lose me, okay? In other words, I can miss them from then on. Because, okay. You know, I take okay, that, so you're I lost. Take that as quite, quite an umbrage. All right, let me tell you, let me tell you, folks, let, let's, 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 we only have like four minutes left. So let me just tell you, uh, Baba, I appreciate you calling. You call as much as you want and you bring your point of view as much as you want. It is important and you know politics done right. Egberto Willis is listening to absolutely everything that you have to say, sir. Are you there? Where's Baba? Baba, are you there? Uh, Tori, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm still here. Okay. <laughs> Bob, are you, Bob, are you, did you go or you're still here? Huh, I don't know what happened to Baba's phone. He must have put it on on, on uh, pause or something. Anyhow, Bob, Baba. I'm uh, right. Exactly. It's listening to absolutely Okay. Thank I, you. Thank you, Bert. I love you and continue having a morning, you know, for our, our brothers, the African and indigenous people who were slaughtered during this time. And it was, and it was a celebration that that the Europeans call Thanksgiving. So let's mourn for our ancestors who were slaughtered by European ancestors, okay? Thank you very much, Baba. Don't forget, keep calling, keep telling folks about the show, yes, and sir. let's let's stay busy. All right, bye. Love you, bro. Love you, man. All right. Love you, love you Tori. All love right. You, Tori. All right, Tori, yeah. Anyhow, this, you know, yeah. and, and that's what I'm trying to, uh, hey, Tori, uh, here, here let, let, um, I'm going to give you a little, little piece here. We are here. I uh, only have like three minutes left. Um, people, okay, so I'll just ahead. finish up. You know, I don't have, patients for small identities, whether it's nationalism or baseball teams or gangs or, uh, you know, just like Republicans and Democrats or racial identity, okay. or, you know, gender identity. They're all tiny little identities. The identity that we all need to have is universal identity. We need to be part of the sun. Okay. You know, we're all just little. Tori, 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 I, I need to cut you right there because um, Go and we're going to have to have that as a big subject of discussion where you, where, you know, where you put the other identity and racial identity into yeah, a, we're in, children of the sun. Uh, you know, yes. Just little pieces of hold the on, universe, hold on, 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 because we have we're to all have part of one big thing. Brother, you are right, but you are, but the the problem is being right is not enough in a racialized society. So we we're going to talk about that as a subject, and I want you to be the protagonist in that subject because okay. you said you said something that we really need to explore and get different about. All right. Okay. Thank you, brother. Anyhow, folks. Ciao. Thank you so kindly for being here on KPFT with us on Politics Done Right. You know how I finish this baby. My name is Egberto Woolies. This is Politics Done Right. And you know how I end this. I am what? Out!
we spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.